Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Miller, and I have the privilege of serving as the Secretary for Pennsylvania's Department of Human Services. Thank you all for being here today. A virus that spread across the world made its first appearance in Pennsylvania not quite six months ago. At the time, in the time since uh, that first Pennsylvania case was confirmed on March 6th, COVID-19 has caused a global pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in a century. We've experienced incredible loss in the Commonwealth since. More than 7,500 Pennsylvanians have died and many thousands more have suffered through a, be a debilitating illness that we are still beginning to understand. I'm extremely proud to serve in an administration that fights every day to meet government's most important responsibility, protecting the lives, health, and safety of people. As many of you know, I am the mother of a four-year-old daughter, Addie. Those of you who are parents know that four years old is a particularly inquisitive time in a child's development. Over the past six months, there are several questions that I've had to answer or tried to answer that I've gotten from my daughter. Mommy, why isn't the playground open? Mommy, why can't you play with me now? Mommy, am I gonna get sick? Mommy, when is the corona gonna be over? This has been an extremely difficult time for families, particularly those with children. And while I know how difficult it's been to look my child in the eye and tell her I don't know how long the playground is gonna be closed, I don't know what it's like to tell a teenager that their high school graduation has been canceled. I don't know what it's like to tell a middle schooler desperate to see their friends that school can't go back to normal yet. I don't know what it's like to tell a child of any age that mommy or daddy lost their job. This virus has been cruel and its effects only compound the longer this crisis drags on. We are going to beat this crisis and things will get better. But right now, I'm here with my colleagues from the Departments of Health and Education to tell Pennsylvania families that we see you and we hear you. I wish I could stand here and tell you exactly what to expect over the next six months, but I can't. I wish I could tell you that a return to normalcy is just around the corner, but I can't. I wish I had answers to all my daughter's questions, but I don't. Here's what I can tell you. The Wolf Administration remains 100% committed to doing everything within our power to keep your family safe. Likewise, we remain committed to doing everything within our power to help your family overcome the myriad of other challenges we face as a result of this pandemic. I want you to know that your family is not alone. There are resources available to help you and you have every right to reach out and ask for help when you need it. In that spirit, we're gonna spend some time this afternoon speaking directly to Pennsylvania's parents, grandparents, foster parents, and anyone else who cares for a child. This year, is going to be different, but we are going to get through this. In fact, DHS has developed some options that we hope will ease the burden of some families of school-aged children who are distance learning either by their own choice or the choice of administrators at their child's school. Our routines have been so disrupted by this crisis that many families have found themselves in the position of searching for childcare options for their school-aged children during times that they would normally be in school and safely supervised by their teachers. Without getting too deep into bureaucratic policy, here's what has changed. Licensed and therefore regulated childcare has always been an option in Pennsylvania for children up to age 15. However, because school age children are expected to be in school for the bulk of the day, there are restrictions on licensed childcare for school age children. We recognize that families need flexibility right now, so we're significantly modifying and relaxing restrictions on school-aged childcare. Here's what this means in real life. First, families may create collectives or learning pods 
of other trusted families in their community who can depend on each other for supervised childcare during school hours. And you don't need to go through a licensing process to do this. On the DHS website, we've posted a list of recommendations for families considering this option. For example, safety remains a priority and we advise families to stay up to date on the latest COVID-19 guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We want children to be in situations where they are safe and supervised by trusted adults, where they're able to focus on their education and where their interactions with other people are limited so as to minimize the risk of COVID-19 transmission. What we don't want are parents quitting their jobs to stay at home with their children, with their school-aged children. For that reason, we're also collaborating with organizations across Pennsylvania, like the United Way and the YMCA, to establish and strengthen part-day programs for school-aged children. These programs would be hosted in commercial settings rather than homes, but the overall goal is the same as the learning pods. These programs are not certified under child care regulations, but DHS is requiring these programs to follow certain criteria, including developing health and safety plans for COVID-19 mitigation, and to comply with requirements under Pennsylvania's Child Protective Services Law for all adults working with children to have background clearance checks. We're working on a search tool for the DHS website that families will be able to use to find information about these part-day school-age programs. When non-licensed providers notify the department that they are open to provide school-aged childcare, we will post the contact information so families looking for options can find it. Starting today, we'll be collecting this information from organizations that are providing this service to families in their community. Once we verify that a program meets our criteria, we'll post the information to our website for families to access. When possible, we do recommend that families enroll their children in a certified child care program. Certified programs have routine oversight and must comply with statewide child care regulations. Certified programs may be able to accommodate your child's schoolwork, but it's important to note that it depends on the individual provider. So make sure that you have that discussion with the provider before enrolling your child. You can find certified child care in Pennsylvania at findchildcare.pa.gov or contact your Early Learning Resource Center, or ELRC. You can find your ELRC at www.raiseyourstar.org. While we're talking about child care, I want to take this opportunity to remind all Pennsylvanians that we all have a responsibility to protect children from child abuse and neglect. Back in the spring, when schools closed, we saw a roughly 40 to 50% decline in child abuse reporting. And that makes sense when you think about the fact that of the 39,000 reports made by mandated reporters to Childline in 2018, more than a third were reported by school employees. Even this summer, with summer camps and library story times canceled, we've seen a 10 to 12% decrease in Childline reports compared to these same months last year. With so many schools starting the 2020-21 school year with an entirely virtual or hybrid learning model, this reduced interaction between children and educators remains a concern. In home-based learning pods and flexibilities for school-age childcare, there are opportunities for other members of the community to step up and protect a child, and I encourage you to do so. If you suspect that a child is being abused or neglected, please call Childline at 1-800-932-0313. You don't have to be a mandated reporter to protect a child and make that call to Childline. Whether it's a neighbor, family member, student, client, or someone you encounter in a store. If you suspect that something is wrong, you can call Childline at 1-800-932-0313 and make an anonymous report. Signs of potential abuse and neglect can include numerous unexplained injuries or bruises, 
chronic anxiety and expressed feelings of inadequacy, poor impulse control, demonstrating abusive behavior or talk, flinching or avoiding being touched, cruelty to animals or others, and fear of their parent or caregiver. Making the call to child line allows trained welfare professionals and if necessary, law enforcement to follow up, collect information, and determine if assistive services or other intervention is necessary. I wanna talk about other programs available to families that are enduring both a public health crisis and an economic one. DHS administers most of Pennsylvania's public assistance system. This is Medicaid, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, and the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP. In what we once knew as normal times, Pennsylvania's public assistance system served approximately 3.3 million people. 3.3 million people who are able to go to the doctor, purchase food for themselves and their families, heat their homes in the winters, and pay bills because of these programs. The economic crisis caused by COVID-19 has made these programs even more crucial for more Pennsylvania families. SNAP helps expand what may already be a tight budget. It helps families not have to skip a bill in order to have enough to eat that week. It keeps food on the table and in the pantry. Children who have enough to eat go on to graduate from high school at a higher rate, earn more as adults, and experience improved health outcomes throughout their adult life. Pennsylvanians who have lost health coverage or are currently uninsured and need coverage for themselves or their children may qualify for coverage through Medicaid and CHIP. Medicaid and CHIP provide coverage for routine and emergency health services, tests and screenings, and prescriptions. Medicaid and CHIP enroll individuals throughout the year. There's no special enrollment time, so people needing health coverage can apply for these programs anytime. There are income limits for Medicaid, but all children can get coverage through CHIP, regardless of family income. Millions of people across this country have lost their jobs or seen their hours cut back as a direct result of COVID-19's unprecedented assault on our way of life. While we are all in this together, and we will beat this thing together, we are also all struggling under our own individual circumstances that none of us predicted just six months ago. SNAP, Medicaid, CHIP, and the other programs that I mentioned are here for anyone who's struggling to afford food, access health care, and pay the bills that keep a roof over their heads and the heat running in the winter. These are basic needs that we all have, and there's absolutely no shame in reaching out for help when you need it. DHS will continue to be here to support Pennsylvania's families as this public health crisis and period of economic insecurity evolve. Again, you can apply anytime for SNAP, Medicaid, and CHIP online at www.compass.state.pa.us. Before I turn it over to my colleagues, I just want to again acknowledge how taxing this time can be for parents. You are under a lot of pressure right now, but you are not alone in this. In early April, DHS launched the Support and Referral Helpline, a free resource staffed by skilled and compassionate caseworkers who are available 24 seven to counsel Pennsylvanians struggling with anxiety and other challenging emotions due to the COVID-19 emergency. This helpline connects callers to trained professionals who can listen and provide support. It is there for anyone who needs help for whatever reason. If you are struggling with your mental health, you can call this helpline and someone will be on the other end to listen to you. This helpline can be reached toll free 24 seven at 1-855-284-2494. Again, that's 1-855-284-2494. For TTY, dial 724-631-5600. Helpline staff are trained to be accessible, culturally competent, and skilled at assisting people with mental illness, intellectual disabilities, 
co-occurring disorders, other special needs, or someone just looking for a supportive, empathetic person to listen to. And with that, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Secretary of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Miller, and good afternoon. I echo Secretary Miller's comments as we collectively strive to make a healthy Pennsylvania for all. This school year is certainly going to look different for Pennsylvanians, but it is what we need to do to make sure that our children have the best chance possible to go to school in person. For parents and caregivers, here are some key things to add to your back to school list. An extra cloth mask in your child's backpack. Plenty of hand sanitizer. Showing your child how to wash their hands for 20 seconds, or as we all know, the time it takes to sing happy birthday twice. Teaching your child to avoid touching surfaces and then touching their face. And make sure to, meet your, to, to see your pediatrician to make sure that your child is up to date on their immunizations, including, and it's so important this year, a flu vaccine. If your child is sh sick, make sure that they stay home from school, especially if they have symptoms that could be consistent with COVID-19. This could include fever, cough, and shortness of breath, chills, but also diarrhea, sore throat, and a new loss of taste or smell. If your child has these symptoms, please contact your pediatrician to discuss testing. We can all lead by example. Caregivers, family members, school staff, and other trusted adults play an important role in helping children make sense of what they hear. Please remain calm and reassuring when you're speaking to your child about COVID-19 and how the school year will be different. Work to minimize their anxiety and their fear. Pay attention to what children are seeing and hearing on television and through social media. Consider reducing screen time. Too much information on this topic could lead to anxious thoughts. And even if you don't have a child returning to school, your actions impact whether or not they will be able to remain in the classroom. If you think that you need a mask, you need a mask. If you're in a store where people are not following the mandatory mask order, make a choice to leave the store. If you're getting together with people who have been vocal about not changing their habits, not wearing masks, make a choice not to see them at this time. As much as our efforts are about laws and mandates and orders for safety, they are really, in the end, about your choices. We are all in this together and we share a collective responsibility a collective responsibility to stop the spread. So remember, stay calm, stay alert, and stay safe. As Pennsylvanians near and far begin a new journey into this school year. And at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Secretary Rivera of the Department of Education. Thank you, Secretary Levine and Secretary Miller. In reiterating what was shared by my colleagues, we know that the 2020-2021 school year will look different than any other school year in our state's history. And the school year will look different from community to community, and even student to student. Throughout the summer, PBE worked with partners inside and outside of state government to create resources to help school leaders make difficult decisions about the return to school. While there's been great emphasis on how instruction will be delivered this year, whether it's in person, virtual, or blended, PBE and our partners are equally focused on the other supports that schools provide to students. For instance, we know schools are more than just classrooms where students receive academic instruction. They are incubators for social and emotional growth, places where, stu where children meaningfully engage with one another and other adults, where they learn teamwork and develop resiliency. 
to help our educators and families be mindful of how social-emotional learning is impacted under the current conditions, the Department of Education has made resources available on approaches to student and staff wellness during COVID-19. These resources will continue to be updated in the coming weeks. We also know there's great concern for our students with special needs. With our partners at the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Networks, or PATEN, and the Peel Center, PDE has made resources available to, to support educators and families to ensure these students receive the supports they need to adapt their educational plans. We also distributed $20 million in federal funding to provide educational services for students with disabilities who may be negatively impacted by COVID-19 mitigation efforts and may encounter additional challenges through the new academic year. Finally, we know that the only meals that many of our students receive reliably are through the national school breakfast and school lunch programs. So when COVID-19 triggered the statewide school closure last spring, working together and using federal waivers, communities served more than 24 million meals to Pennsylvania students to ensure they maintained access to life-sustaining nutrition. Last week, we sent a letter to Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, asking USDA to extend the flexibilities in student nutrition programs that have been in place throughout the pandemic. These flexibilities have benefited countless Pennsylvania children and families by helping them secure access to nutritious meals in their communities. While PDE has helped schools prepare for the current school year, including multiple rounds of guidance and grant funding, specific decisions around schools are made locally by local school leaders who are best equipped to evaluate local conditions related to risk, needs, and resourcing. Parents and caregivers are vital parts of the dialogue about reopening schools and are encouraged to share their concerns and ask questions of their local school leaders about what to expect and how to engage this year. Our education communities remain singularly focused on the health and safety of students. However, ultimately, families need to be comfortable with how their children are being educated and need to make the best decision for their, for their families. And we stand ready to support and serve those communities as we continue through the start of the school year. Thank you. So now it's my, um, uh, this is our opportunity now to open up to any questions um, that you may have from, uh, from our colleagues in the press. One second. <laughs> see you there. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, for being available to us today. So, you know, we had districts that started to head back this week. You know, we had one district that was open for one day. We had cases. We have a whole district that is now shut down for a few days. Um, when you released your plan for these, you know, these recommendations for the districts from, you know, different models in, in hybrid, in person, um, did that include, you know, drastic shutdowns like we're seeing for a few days for districts? I mean, as you can imagine, parents are trying to give their children who are going back to school some sense of normalcy. Being in the classroom one day and then being home the next day doesn't really provide a lot of normalcy. And then also, as Secretary Miller saying, you know, parents are trying to figure out what they're going to do for work. And to think that your children is going to be back in school one day and then to be back in home the next day that is far from normal. So what is the recommendation for districts who are, you know, leaving it up to themselves basically to decide whether they're going to shut the whole district down, a school down, quarantine a classroom? I mean, what do we do here? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, Brian. Um, first and foremost, in, when, um, when the pandemic hit and we had to shut down schools in March, um, the Department of Education, my team, in partnership with the Department of Health team and, and leaders across the Commonwealth, including um, superintendents and other school leaders, we started to engage in, um, you know, first in surface level dialogue and then engage much more deeply around um, what the school year might look like. 
So we first um, engaged the third party research arm. It's kind of what we've identified as our Mathematica report, um, who really looked deeply around um, what the data and research dictated from across the from across the globe, across the country and other con across our country and other countries as well. Um, and we made that information available um, to schools to start to start planning. We also put out our, our health and safety plans in coordination with the Department of Health. Now, when we looked at our health and safety guidelines, school districts were encouraged to, to engage their local communities as a community voice, submit those plans to the school board for, for review and adoption, post those plans online, and then submit the plans to the Department of Education. First, as we know the volatility of COVID-19, especially now, um, you know, as we're, as we're planning and preparing around school opening, first I encourage every parent to look at their school's health and safety plan. That health and safety plan will identify, um, you know, both the mitigation efforts around COVID-19, but also instructional opportunities, whether they engage in full in-person instruction, a blended learning model, or a virtual, um, you know, instruction option for students. And as we read, many, if not most, of our LEAs of our schools, over seven, you know, over 700 plus, um, you know, plans developed. There's a combination of both, um, you know, whether it's some type of blended learning and um, virtual learning or blended learning and in-person learning, that, uh, that creates that nimbleness that you just described, knowing that today may be a normal day of school and as a result of COVID-19 and, and its transmission, we might have to shift and adjust to a virtual or a blended learning model. And that's, you know, exactly why many of our school leaders have forecasted that need um, and have documented them in the school safety plan. But it's also why we're here today. You know, understand the, the volatility of, of COVID-19 and, and how, um, you know, quickly the transmission, um, you know, can, you know, can be, you know, it can happen. And then ultimately how the numbers and the data and the, and the research continues to evolve the best um, action a family can take around mitigating, um, you know, the virus and, and getting students back to school with some normalcy is exactly that, put mitigation efforts in, um, you know, in place. Um, face covering, social distancing, being safe at home will allow us to continue to keep kids safe at school, which will then ultimately keep more and more kids at school in a traditional manner as much as possible. So first and foremost, let's really focus on, um, you know, the root cause of this and um, keep our families safe at home and throughout our, throughout our communities. I guess this question might be for Secretary Miller. You know, some families who might, some parents who might have younger children who aren't sure whether or not they have some sort of uh, daycare available or, or some, and they have to work. What age can a parent leave a child home? Is there an age recommendation uh, or a, lo a, a law or is it, how's that? Because I'm sure some parents are wondering whether or not is my child old enough to stay home by themselves while I work or stay you know, downstairs while I work upstairs, uh, if childcare is not an option or if the affordability for childcare is not an option. There, there's no law on ha what age a child is safe to be at home. I think it, it's going to depend on the child. It's going to depend on how long you're going to be away and just the maturity of the child and all of those things. So there's no, um, there's no set age limit. And, and that's really, you know, I think we understand, particularly as we're trying to work ourselves out of this um, period of economic insecurity and, and really get people back to work. Um, that's really why we were doing what we're doing in terms of providing more flexibility so that parents have more options. So to your point, if they've got a child at home that is school age that would normally be at school, maybe a learning pod if they can't find childcare, maybe a learning pod is, is something that makes sense for them. So finding some other trusted family members to get together and figure out how they can share responsibility might be an option. So we're just trying to get creative and come up with as many options as we can so that families aren't in a position of having to quit their job to stay at home. Um, I have a follow-up question for Secretary Rivera, uh, specifically about the Mathematica report. So I know that the Mathematica report, it recommended, um, or, or the, your, your agency recommended based on its findings that schools use a hybrid schedule. Um, and that would be the best way to limit transmission in schools. But did that report anticipate students moving throughout the day to like a variety of care settings? Because I, I guess that's what we see happening now where if a, if a school is only open for four hours, then you know you might have a kid going from school to daycare to home, or from school to family, like you know, grandmother's house to home. And so, 
I guess, you know, even if the hybrid option limits transmission in schools, do you feel confident it will limit transmission in the community? So as, as we shared, um, both through the research report and the continuous guidance we put out, um, you know, why we've identified it, identify them as guidance is because we understand um, that social conditions um, are, are different community to community, um, you know, school district to school district and, and geographic area um, to geographic area across the Commonwealth. So what was taken into account when we look at mitigation, mitigating um, the transmission of COVID-19, our, our life circumstances, right? So we understand that if, if we fall into a transmission rate where the data dictates that, that a school district consider um, blended learning um, or virtual instruction, um, that, you know, that is really put into effect to protect the, the masses at, at the uh, school district at the school level and then ultimately keep the families safe at home. But, you know, we also know that there is going to be no substitute um, for due diligence of the, of the family, um, you know, ensuring that, that children are, um, you know, being mindful, um, their students are being mindful, you know, ensuring that, um, you know, as Dr. Levine shared, um, we're looking closely at, at some of the symptoms and, and the look-fors around COVID-19. So, you know, guidance is exactly that. It's guidance. But ultimately, what we're providing is one tool in the toolkit to help create a holistic environment for students and families to be safe and healthy. So I wouldn't say that you should consider our guidance as a standalone. It's using our guidance for schools, the Department of Health guidance, you know, for public health um, you know, safety and security, health and safety, and then ultimately even the resources put out there in, for, by the Department of Human Services um, to address issues of, of mental health, health, and food security. So all, everything that we're doing collectively are tools and resources that families should utilize to support their families and their students holistically. So there's no one size fits all, but what we're doing together can help support most families in the Commonwealth. So, um, you know, now that we're like looking at this in practice, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Like, are you still confident that the hybrid model will be the best way to limit transmission? Or as we see kids and families moving throughout these like pods and, you know, kids moving throughout different settings during the day. I mean, is this like a like, I guess, a wrinkle that maybe we're having second thoughts about? You know, so when you think about it, our families have started school, you know, some of them this week, and, and they're seeing this for the first time in practice. Um, but the data, the research, and the science that we've been tracking along um, with our partners at the Department of Health and, and other departments, um, have, we've been tracking um, other states who are addressing this real time, other countries who are addressing the pandemic real time. So we've learned and we continue to learn from the lessons of others that are putting, um, you know, these strategies in place practically. So, uh, you know, for us, here in the Commonwealth, whereas um, students are starting school now, we've been following the data, the science, and the research from others and learning from others that have put, um, you know, these practices in place before us. Okay. Dr. Rivera, I, have, I guess kind of a follow-up to that question. Looking at your dashboard as far as the recommendation of what, what districts should be doing, there are dozens, if not more than that, districts that could be doing hybrid that are doing remote. Can you explain, do you have a theory as to why they are opting for that? And are you in any way lobbying for getting the kids back in the school? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so first and, and foremost, from a public health perspective, we know um, that in-person instruction, kids coming to school is, is the best case scenario, um, you know, to address their social, emotional, um, you know, health and wellness needs. But we also understand that the data that we're providing around transmission of students and the needs of students is, again, one data set. Um, and, and I think an important factor as we're, as we're considering why school leaders are making the decisions that they are, student transmission, probably the most important factor, but it's one of the factors. Because at the same time, schools have to work um, to consider transmission rates amongst their staff. And if teachers, um, you know, fall ill, um, you know, contract COVID, then there isn't an ins a teacher in front of the classroom to be able to provide instruction. They're also taking into account, um, you know, their ability and the resources to, to maintain um, clean and healthy um, environments, uh, you know, both, um, you know, physically and environmentally. And we also have to take into account our families. We know that many students also go home, um, you know, to, to households with, with aging family members. And, and so it's easy to look at one specific data set and say, well, you know, um, you know, children are less likely to transmit um, or to, to become hospitalized themselves. But we know that, um, you know, children, um, students, uh, you know, underage students in, in our schools don't live in a, in a vacuum or a bubble. They go home and they engage um, with other um, 
you know, citizens, other Commonwealth um, neighbors that, that fall within those other areas. So as, as we look at the, the toolkit, as we look at um, the, the threshold in terms of the tool uh, created by the Department of Health and, um, and PDE, we know that students are one factor but we also have to work to keep our educators, our staff and faculty safe and to keep families and communities healthy and safe as well. Hi, Secretary Rivera, this is also for you. Um, you know, from hearing from parents, I've heard parents cry because they are so upset that their students who already disliked learning are going fully virtual um, and that they're having a hard time. You know, they have to be at work so they can't be there to make sure that they are getting the education they need. What would you recommend or what resources or where would you advise those families turn to maybe send their teenage son or daughter who frankly isn't doing well with virtual? Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a great question. And, and first, I think it's important for me to share um, the three of us up here are, are parents as well. And as much as we've been discussing, um, you know, public health, public education, public, sa public safety considerations, we've never taken our parent hat off. Um, I'm, you know, I'm the father of a, of, a, of a daughter going into fourth grade and a high schooler. And, and so many of the decisions that my team and I make um, day to day have implications for me um, at home, for not only with my kids, but also my spouse who, um, you know, also has her opinion on, on uh, you know, as a, as a parent and a mother as well. And so, you know, first, understand that we fully know um, that, you know, the, the mitigation efforts that we're recommending based on science and based on research and based on data are difficult. We, we would never once uh, fool ourselves into saying that, that this, these are easy conditions. But I also have to, you know, say and remind all of us that the conditions that we're recommending and the mitigation efforts that we're recommending are not the fault of, of government or those of us looking to serve our community. Um, this is the fault of a pandemic. Um, this is the, the, the fault of a virus that, that has been novel and we're still learning more about um, each and every day. And, and first and foremost, as I share with my own daughter, uh, I want her to go back to school as well. But more than anything else, as, as a parent, I want her to be safe. I want her to be healthy. And I know at times we may look at the percentages and say, well, they're relatively low percentages. And families may look at the percentages and say, well, they're relatively low percentages. But as parents, we know that that percentage looks very different when it's your child in front of you that falls within that category. So the position that we're taking first and foremost is to keep all of our kids safe. To, to, to protect every student so that they're going to be healthy and, and safe, you know, when they're home with their families and, and their parents as well. But we also know that there are other efforts that, that we should think outside the box, um, you know, to incorporate, some of which, uh, which you know, we shared earlier with, um, with Secretary Miller. Families are, are creating pods, communities amongst themselves um, to help support education. I think as families, you know, look towards that option, they're in a really good position to, to, to ensure that those who are coming together are adhering to social distancing guidelines, um, you know, health guidelines and, and being, you know, health, healthy and safe themselves. And many schools, especially for some of our most vulnerable learners, are putting, um, you know, systems and supports in place. And the, but they're also doing so, taking the consideration of the Department of Health and Education into account. So there are lots of options that exist and, and you know, opportunities to think outside the box. But my biggest, uh, you know, I guess uh, uh, a statement would be, you know, please, when looking into alternative methods, uh, modes of, of, of instruction um, or engagement, you know, first and foremost, let's focus on the health and safety of our students because bringing down that, you know, bringing down those numbers, um, maintaining healthy and safe communities is the only way we will get back to the new nor our new normal and get, you know, get into school. Thank you. Now, you mentioned that you guys are doing, giving out a lot of guidelines to schools, but are there any requirements if a school makes a decision? Will there be a situation in which you guys step in and say, actually, we do want you to shut down or actually we do want you to stay open or is it entirely up to them? So face coverings are, 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 um, are in order. Um, you know, from the governor and, and the secretary of health because of the science and, and the data. Um, social distancing, you know, guidelines, we make strong recommendations around the six feet um, as, as the golden standard for, uh, for social distancing. We've also put guidelines out for, um, for uh, cleaning, 
um, and, um, you know, and, and maintaining, um, you know, physical space. And so we provided a great deal of, of detail around what they should consider when preparing the school. And then ultimately, we know that school districts, because, you know, I, I visited um, hundreds of school districts over the past five years. And I can tell you um, they are as diverse and, and dynamic as, um, as the communities we live in. And some schools and school districts can engage in social distancing practices right away. Others had to think outside the box. So, um, you know, that's really why we've adhered to guidelines so that they can, um, they can personalize them around the needs of their community. And so if there is a case that pops up, are they required to notify staff or parents? And if so, in what detail? Yeah, and that's a great question. So first, as cases, um, you know, as, as cases are identified, you know, first I have to, to make it a point to share um, with the community at large, the Department of Health and PDE have been working really closely and the Department of Health is helping guide them through, um, you know, the, the practice as to what to do, um, you, know, when, um, you know, when a case is identified. I also want to make sure that although COVID-19 is, is a novel um, virus, um, school districts have planned for years through their safety plans around how to address um, illness and, and other, um, you know, viruses as they transpired. I mean, most, you know, superintendents who, who have been in place can tell you what they've done in instances of measles, mumps, whooping cough, and the like. And so how they communicate um, those illnesses to families and how they, how they employ mitigation efforts is very similar to this, other than the fact that this is COVID-19. So school districts are just employing those safety plans that they have, um, you know, in place, except now they're doing it in response to COVID-19. It's up to them. Is no, there is, a, there's a, there's a plan as to how they communicate. They will communicate with families. The means by which they communicate is in their local um, school plan. So we encourage uh, families to look that up. This is actually for um, Secretary Levine. <clears throat> Hi, Secretary. How are Hi. you? Um, so, you know, obviously, um, as we were saying, we have seen some districts that have had some cases. We just have a small percentage of schools that went back this week. We are going to see the majority of districts go back in some form over the next couple of weeks. The trajectory has been going down, correct? The trajectory of new cases in Pennsylvania has been going down significantly, and we're very pleased with that. So if we see kids, if we do see a, an uptick in cases uh, from kids and we're able to trace it back to kids or from, uh, to schools, is there any plan to do targeted mitigation like we did in, in other in industries, not to say schools are, is an industry, but in, in schools in Pennsylvania? Uh, would, could we see a situation where we could say we are remote across the board for a period of time? It's impossible for me to predict the, the future, but we do have plans in place. I mean, we are continuing all of our containment efforts. So just like for any other positive case, if a child in school uh, or a teacher in school is positive, uh, then we will get uh, that result through the laboratory. Uh, we will have our case um, investigators be contacting that family or that teacher. Uh, they will get the information about their location, etc., their contacts. Uh, then our contact tracers will be notifying the, the contact to quarantine. Um, so all of that will continue in schools and the Pennsylvania Department of Health will be in charge of that as well as of course the County Municipal Health Department. So all of that information will continue. Uh, so we are going to be working on those containment measures as well as the, the guidelines that we discussed in terms of um, counties that have low community spread, moderate community spread, or have substantial. So those are the, uh, the recommendations and the uh, what we're working on. What would happen in the in a, in a prospective future, it's hard for me to predict. You can't say one way or another which way. No, I mean, it, we, we will take whatever actions are necessary to protect the public health, but we have a very good plan uh, for the start of school moving forward, and then we're going to be working with the Pennsylvania Department of Education really, really closely, and we're going to be following the situation on the ground. And then just one last quick sure. follow-up to that. So Susquehanna School District, uh, for example, I know the Department of Health is saying that you cannot say how many cases are in that district. Why is that, if that, how does that violate HIPAA by saying this is a certain number that we've seen in the district without releasing any information, personal information? 
Well, so, I mean, we are, uh, I mean, we are tracking positive cases, um, but the, the school district is being notified by uh, the way they would if a child that had influenza or whatever by parents. We don't, we might not have that information before the school has the information. So, uh, we, we know we're not going to comment on any specific report um, uh, as, it, as, it, as it comes out, and, and we're going to be looking at our data um, and, you know, making recommendations and reports based upon the data that we get through the laboratory analysis. And then, of course, there is a slight delay. We have to get that data, then our case investigators have to call, and then the contact traces are informed. That's happening really, really rapidly now, but the, the parent might call the school before we have that information. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so on a, on a similar note, I, um, I'm wondering if the, the Department of Health or PDE will do something similar to what uh, the Department of Human Services has done in tracking outbreaks in daycare centers and whether or not um, there will be a public way, like public disclosure of like outbreaks or known cases traced back to schools. And I'm also wondering, um, you know, going forward, how will the state study whether like what, what school opening methods have been effective? Mm -hmm. And are there, um, I guess, like, do schools have to tell, or what have schools been told about reporting cases to the Department of Health? And could a school conceivably not disclose a case to the Department of Health? Maybe disclose it to their local community, to their parents, but what, what, what mechanisms are in place to make sure that schools are disclosing information to the state so the state can know what's working, what's not? Well, the school doesn't call the Department of Health. I mean, they call with questions, and we have a whole system set up to, to help schools. But we get our information from the laboratory. So if a patient is positive, we get that information from the laboratory test and then we follow our, our exact plan. So there is no requirement for the school district to notify us. I mean, we're going to find out through a completely different mechanism. Um, and of course, I mean, we're working with PDE on the best way in terms of communicating um, all of that information, and we're, we're coming to ground on that. Um, and uh, we will be evaluating that data really closely in terms of the trends um, as, the school, as the school year progresses. It's just starting now, and we've been watching all of our data really, really closely. Um, I guess it'll be the state contracting or contact tracing system that will allow you to identify schools if they're the source of an outbreak. Through the case investigations and contact tracing system, that's exactly. So when, when we find out that a person is positive, that John Smith, who's seven years old in a certain school district is positive, we will be, from the lab, we will be contacting that family. We get case investigations. One of the questions will be the schools. Do you have an update on the current, like, um, I guess, turnaround time or how long it takes right now for a, a case investigation to begin after um, getting a result? Yeah, uh, within 24 to 48 hours, most within 24 hours. Do you think, it, will, will, it, will the state be able to maintain that? Um, do you have, like, the staffing complement to maintain that going into the fall? We are developing the staffing complement to maintain that, yes. Thank you. Thank you all.